Warzone Studio was kind enough to send out a couple of their battle mitts for us to review, and I have to say you guys, I absolutely love them. The mats we received have the kill team layout on them, making it quicker and easier to place objectives and terrain pieces to create a good play experience. The mousepad material the mats are made from is an upgrade from the foldable cardstock boards that you are used to seeing come in kill team boxes. So make sure to check them out and thank you to Warzone Studio for sponsoring this video. Hello everybody and welcome back yet again to Command Point for a very, very exciting uh day it is ryan it's embargo day it is embargo it's day. nightmare day the embargo yeah. is lifted ave dominus nox we have come for you uh the new night lords and uh mandrake kill teams are upon us i don't i don't think i've ever been as excited for a release as this one for this edition of yeah. kill team and i think i speak for a lot of people you speak for me, that's for sure. I'm thrilled about this box. Both these teams look so cool. And first, in this episode, we're going to be talking about the Mandrake squad. Mm -hmm. um, and in the other video, which should also be out right now, you could check out the, our, uh, our review of the Night Lords. So, I mean, I, Ryan, I think we're both a little more excited for the Night Lords, but I got to say, I was surprised by how cool I find this Mandrake team to be. And honestly, I, I really cannot wait to play them, and I can't wait to talk about them here. All right, so let's get into it then. Okay, so getting started, uh, the Mandrake kill team has nine operatives, and they can take the Infiltration, Recon, and Seek and Destroy uh, archetypes for their TAC Ops. Um, you get a Night Fiend, who is your leader, and then you get eight Mandrake operatives. Uh, four of them are going to be your specialists, and the other four, it looks like, are going to be just basic Mandrake warriors. So I think it's going to be like a lot of the other elf teams, honestly, I've noticed, where it's kind of like one list, but they're more like... Well, I guess that's not true for Blades of Cain at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, um, it's not so much specialist-based, I guess, is my point, rather than like the mechanics, it seems. Yeah. Um, so I guess, uh, do we want to start with... Uh, where do we want to start, Ryan? Because I think we should not start at the faction tech ops. I think we should revisit that once we go over the team. Right. So um, I I think the the what we should start with is probably like their faction ability because they have some pretty interesting stuff. Stuff that I don't think we've seen in this game before. Yeah. So I guess I mean we can start with uh there there's the core concept that a lot of these rules kind of wrap into, which is it's going to refer to something called within shadow. So if any of these rules say within shadow or want your models to be, quote, within shadow, that basically just means that it's within one inch of a heavy part of a terrain feature that is not lower than it. Uh, any part of its base is underneath a vantage point or it's within one inch of a shadow portal token, which we'll get to later. Um, so the first unique thing is shadow passage. So basically once per turn, and this is an important thing, you can only do this once per turning point, uh, one of your Mandrakes can do the Shadow Passage action. So basically if the Mandrake is within Shadow, it's a 1 AP action. You do a free normal move, but instead of moving it, you just pick up the model and you put it anywhere else on the whole board that is within Shadow, but not within engagement range or line of sight of enemy operatives. So basically as long as you're putting them in, you know, conceal in cover or something they're within and, and you know within shadow obviously then you can put them there they can be as close as you want to another operative and uh an enemy operative as long as they don't have the ability to like shoot you wherever you are um the only other special thing is that you can't make shooting attacks basically until the next turn so you can't like drop a guy in and alpha strike your opponent which is probably for the best um but in general, this Ryan is really, really cool. Yeah, I think it's an insane ability. Um, having so much freedom of movement just from this ability, even though you can only do it with one model uh, once per turn, that can be incredibly clutch, and it can give you a huge advantage in your games. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think in general, what sticks out to me is like playing on open... Well, first of all, this works on Into the Dark. There's nothing to suggest this doesn't work on Into the Dark yep. or Beta Decima. So, I mean, that is crazy in and of itself. Um, and honestly, like, I just think mid-board objective, 
this team can you can just throw one of your warriors up or maybe another operative and and grab an objective basically and yeah. and you don't have to worry about positioning your model and deployment in a spot where it's close enough to get it uh you could just teleport there and then you're there so that's pretty awesome there's uh next we have umbral entities which basically just uh denotes that your mandrakes have a five up invuln but if they're within shadow they have a four up invuln which is pretty interesting because this is the nine model elf chassis kind of like hand of the archon or corsairs who are both eight wound teams with four up saves um and this is the nine model team with a five up invuln which is worse i would say than a four up save but if they're within shadow then they're actually much tankier in terms of their their defense dice save mm-hmm. with a four up invuln so and i suspect you're going to be spending a lot of the game within shadow with this team very deliberately yeah uh ryan and do you want to talk about soul strike because soul strike is a little bit interesting yeah it's very common on this team yeah so it reminds me of kind of like the i think it was like the balefire blast from first edition Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Mandrake operatives have ranged weapons with the Soul Strike special rule. Each time a friendly operative makes a shooting attack with such a weapon in the roll defense dice step of that shooting attack, successful saves are determined differently. Invulnerable saves cannot be used. Each result that is equal to or less than the target's APL is a successful save and retained. Uh, each result that is higher than the target's APL is discarded, and each retained result of one is a critical save. So basically, the way to think about this is equivalency wise, if you have APL2, you have the equivalent of a five up save. Yeah. And if you're APL3, you have the equivalent of a four up save. So basically, Marines, if you're shooting a Marine with a weapon of Soul Strike, mm-hmm. it effectively has a four up save. Think about it like that. Obviously, you're looking at the results differently because a one is a crit instead of a six, but it, it just goes backwards, right? Yeah. Um, so basically, I mean, Marines getting a four up save against your shooting is really interesting, um, but it's exponentially worse against teams like Hearthkin Salvagers or Hierotech Circle, where they have a lot of two APL models with three up saves. Those two APL models now have five up saves, and that is much, much worse. I don't think I need to like super describe why that's way worse, right? No. And uh, one thing that I forgot to mention was the designer's note at the bottom here uh, that states, many rules in this army list refer to an, uh, to an enemy operative's APL. This would be the APL at the time the rule takes effect, which Ooh. includes modifiers. So if you're knocking so, off an APL, then it, this, is, this is getting a lot better for you. Yeah, like if you stun a two APL model, it basically is only saving on rolls of one. So that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's all the special rules. Let's go down and look at the ploys really quick. Do we want to go with the ploys, or do we want to talk about the, um, the models themselves first? That's a good point. We should go to the operatives. Yeah. Um, so I'll start with the, the Night Fiend. So first of all, the chassis, it's basically it's a regular elf, except it's got that bad save, but that doesn't matter because we have, uh, you know, the Umbral Entity. Yep. Um... But yeah, it's got a Bell Blast, which is basically a bolter, and this is a very common weapon on this team. It's a bolter, but it's got that Soul Strike ability. And if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head, almost all the guns in this team, if not all the guns, well, I should say ranged attacks, they're not guns, Yeah, um, have the Soul Strike ability. So that it's a very common thing, and it's, it's going to be something you're going to have to think about when you're playing against Mandrakes. Um, so he's got just a regular Bell Blast, four shots on threes, three, four, with Soul Strike. So... Basically better than a bolter. Sometimes it's the same. Um, and it's got a couple unique abilities. Uh, oh, and also it has the melee weapon. <laughs> I almost just skipped the melee weapon. Uh, it is five attacks on twos, four, six, lethal five up and stun. It's a husk blade. So right off the bat, stun. Um, granted, it's a little bit harder to subtract APL and melee with stun. I think it takes two crits because the first crit like does a parry or whatever, basically. Um, but there is a little bit of stun right away, which is cool for Soul Strike. Um, a good melee weapon. Just get that out of the way now. That's a really good melee weapon. Uh, but he's got two rules. The first one is Harrowing Whispers, 
So each time your opponent would activate a ready enemy operative within six inches of this operative, you can roll 1d6, and if the result is greater than their APL, your opponent cannot activate them, basically. And they have to pick somebody else. And if there is nobody else, then the effect doesn't work, and they just activate that guy. But that is crazy. Um, and it doesn't suggest... It's not once per turn, it's each time. Yeah. So if your leader is within six inches of a guy that with like two APL, every time they try to activate that guy, until they're out of other guys, they you get to roll and possibly just say no. Um, that's pretty insane. Yeah. Like, obviously, there's some risk to this, right? Because... He's your leader. Let's say, he's your leader. So if he, like, the idea is maybe you'd move him up within six of like a melta gun. And then the, maybe the guardsman melta just doesn't get to go. <laughs> but, um, you know, in the event that they do go, then you're probably losing your leader. Um, but still, just like the upside is kind of wild. Uh, and it doesn't say an enemy within six invisible. It, so it could be like, you could be on the other side of an Octarius wall and just stopping activation. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Like, and if he's within six of multiple guys, then like you could just keep trying to stop him. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, I don't know what happens if, I guess eventually you would run out of guys to do it to, and then the effect would have no effect. Yeah. But um, kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then there's the, the Ubli X. Ryan, did you want to talk about the Ubli X? Sure. Yeah. So at the start of each turning point, or if this operative incapacitates an enemy with its husk blade, it's, Ubli X becomes active. When it becomes active, each time an attack dice would inflict damage on this operative, you can roll a d6, and on a 5-up, ignore the damage inflicted from that attack dice, and the uh, Ubli X is no longer active uh, after that. So, pretty cool piece That's of uh, defensive tech there. Really good. Like, I mean, you basically always have it online, I mean, until it goes off, and then it comes back next turn. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of worse than, I don't know, is it worse or, because it's like, it's on a five up, you just, you just get just a scratch. Yes. Right. So (laughs) this model is crazy. Yeah. Just, I mean, we're, we're off to the first model here. It's the leader, but there's so much variance in this guy baked in where like a weird roll can just like swing a whole game. I feel. Mm hmm on one little interaction yeah and it's there's two ways for it to happen so i mean like let's say that your opponent charges him and like he or like your opponent activates a guy within six with the intent to charge him first they need to hope that you don't roll and just say no yeah then if they get in and they hit you each time they hit you you might just just to scratch it and then kill them back um i don't even know what to make of this guy he's crazy he's pretty good um he's very disruptive and he's got a really good melee profile so yeah (laughs) do we want to move on to the abyssal yeah okay so the abyssal is uh he's got a pretty good uh shooting profile here he's got a bail surge which has two profiles on it so it's blast which is five shots on threes three four soul strike blast two inches so pretty good and then there's burn, which is the same thing, but instead of blast, it has lethal five. So again, pretty playing good. this on um, on a into the dark. Yeah, you just always take the you blast. You just always take the blast. Yeah, because you're yeah. going to be getting that lethal five anyway. That's kind of silly, but anyways, move on. Yeah, um, and then a glimmer steel blade, which is four attacks on threes, four five lethal five up. That's a pretty decent melee weapon. Mm-hmm. Um. And then, uh, so, okay, I'm going to talk about the action before the ability, because I think the action provides some context to the ability. So, yeah. Or, I don't know, maybe it's vice versa. But anyway, so basically he has a unique one APL action called Wreath in Balefire. Uh, you select one operative visible to him that does not have a Balefire token. Note that it could be an enemy or a friendly. It doesn't specify. Until the start of this guy's next activation, or until it's, it dies, whichever comes first, uh, the selected operative gains a Bellfire token. And then that uh, this operative cannot perform it with an engagement range. Okay, so here's what the Bellfire token does. Um, so if you give it to an enemy, 
Each time one of your guys shoots a guy that has a Bellfire token, for that shooting attack, you add one to both damage characteristics of that friendly operative's ranged weapons, and it gets the no-cover rule. So if this guy can see a guy, he can, like an enemy that's like a plasma that's not engaged, say just shot one of your guys and the abyssal can see him, you can give that plasma gunner a Bellfire token and then shoot him with the burn profile which would be five attacks on threes, four five, lethal five up, soul strike, and no cover. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and you know what's interesting? I'm wondering if the how that interacts with blast. I'm assuming that only the attack onto the guy with the bellfire token would have the benefit. I don't know if it blasts onto other people if it keeps that profile, but that's weird. Um, anyway, and if you give it to a friendly operative, then when an enemy operative shoots them uh they subtract one from the damage characteristics of their weapons so very interesting um and it says to a minimum of one so really good damage reduction there if you want it and i'm sure there's going to be times when you do like if you set this guy up say you're playing on capture or something and there is like a midboard objective you can teleport him out of the midboard objective and then give himself a bellfire token so that way he's like super duper tangy. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's a, a good idea. Maybe not. But what do you think of the Abyssal Ren? Seems like a pretty sweet model. Pure offense, it seems like so far. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to keep that train rolling with the Chooser of the Flash. Right? You want to go over him? Yeah. So uh, he's got Bail Blast. Uh, he's got a unique melee weapon with the Bail Blade. Uh, four attacks on threes, damage five, six, with brutal, lethal five up, and reap two. Uh, he's got the soul harvest ability. So each time an enemy operative is incapacitated as a result of this operative's part collector ability or bail blade, uh, including as a result of its reap critical hit rule, add one of your soul harvest tokens to your pool, or two if that enemy operative has an APL characteristic of three or more. Each time a friendly Mandrake operative is activated, you can spend one of your Soul Harvest tokens to either add one to that operative's APL until the end of the battle, Ooh. Ooh. or have it regain D6 lost wounds. I'm I'm taking the plus one APL every time. Probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can spend your Soul Harvest tokens even if this operative has been incapacitated. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's read Park yeah, Collector yeah, yeah, yeah. and then... Uh, <laughs> a part collector, each time an enemy operative performs the fallback action within engagement range of this operative, you can use this ability. If you do so, that enemy operative suffers D6 mortal wounds before it moves. Okay, All so right. that's cute. But yeah. can we talk about Soul Harvest? Oh my god. <laughs> can so, we? Like, I've, this is the first time I think we've seen this kind of thing where like, you give a guy plus one APL for the game. Yeah, like, this they is just, just become... like... It's just like better power from pain, it feels like. Kind of. So I, this is not my first look at the teams, so I, I can say I've thought about this a lot. Noteworthy things. This team does not have a comm specialist, so, and they don't. none of their employees give them an extra APL. So this is, to be fair, the only way they can get extra APL. Granted, when they get it, it's permanent. Yeah. And... uh you know, really good. But it is entirely tied to this one guy yeah. killing something in melee, basically. Yeah. So I feel like if yeah, you misplay yeah. this model and he dies early, like you're kind of just screwed, right? Mm hmm. I kind of get that vibe too. Um, he, he is a monster, and they do have ways where, like, you can't even really charge him because. The, We'll get to it later, but there's a really good tactical ploy to make you fight first. Um, so, like, really, this guy just needs to not get shot off the board before he charges something, and you're probably okay. Um, but, like, man, wow. Yeah. Uh, th that is, if he gets a kill, I mean, if he kills, like, a Marine, which he could with that melee, um, I don't see how you lose a game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, you suddenly you're, like, you basically create two other Marines, you know, yeah. you get two, three APL guys and that's pretty nuts on a mm -hmm. team like this. So I don't know. He's awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the dirge maw. Um, so 
he's got a bell blast, regular bell blast, and then he has a like an awesome flamer thing. It's like indirect. Like I don't even know if I call this. A, it's too good to be a flamer. Yeah. Um, five shots on twos, two two, six inch range, indirect, soul strike, mortal wounds two, and stun. So uh, it's basically two four. It's indirect. This reads like it would have limited, but it doesn't. Um, he just screams at you. <laughs> yeah. A lot of uh, screaming has, going on in this box. Yeah. Um he uh he has soul strike on it, so I mean this is this is a really, really good the extent of how good it is. I haven't like math hammered it, but like I'm looking at this. This is a really good profile. Yeah, and then he's got a glimmer steel blade. Okay, but there's a couple abilities here that are really good here. Um haunting focus. So once in each strategy phase, when it's your turn to use a strategic player pass, you can use this ability. Nice. If you do so, select one enemy operative for this operative to for this operative to focus on until the end of the turning point. When your opponent would activate that enemy operative, if this operative is ready, you can activate him first. If you do so during that activation, you cannot select any other enemy operatives as targets for combats or shooting attacks made by this operative while that enemy operative is in the kill zone. Uh, so th- that ability is like pretty awesome. Um, I mean, this is like disruption tech kind of yeah, in its own weird way. Like ideally the first thought that comes into my mind is you move him up onto a mid board on turn one and then on turn two, whoever is threatening him the most, you focus on that guy. And basically you're just going to kill them before they kill you. Um, and there's not really much you can do about it. Um, you can also use him kind of as like a bodyguard almost. Like if you bring him up near the, uh, chooser of the flesh Mm -hmm. and then whoever's threatening the chooser of the flesh, the dirge maw is just going to focus on them and stop them from killing the chooser of the flesh. That is awesome. Uh, let's talk about the unique action here. Uh, para, paradolic projection, uh, basically select one enemy operative within shadow or in his line of sight. Uh, for, uh, first sentence before I even read what this does, like within shadow, that could be like the whole other team on turn one. Yes. Um, uh, until the start of this operative's next activation, or until this operative is incapacitated, whichever comes first, that enemy operative is treated as being injured, regardless of any rules that say it cannot be injured, and its APL cannot be positively modified. You remove any positive APL modifiers it has, if it has any. And uh, yeah, and then it can't do an engagement range. So that's amazing. <laughs> um, you just like, okay, their heavy gunner is behind heavy cover, or their, you know, their plasma gunner is behind heavy cover hiding. Yeah. It's in, uh, you know, it's in shadow. <laughs> so now it's injured. Um, this team so just like. Mean. <laughs> yeah, this team just messes with you. Yeah, the, it seems like the whole play style is just like messing up your opponent's plans. Yeah, that's really not a common thing in Kill Team. No. So I'm curious to see how this plays. And there's one more uh, specialist, Ryan. Do you want to go over him? Yeah, so this is the Shade Weaver. Uh, so the Shade Weaver has Bail Blast and a Glimmer Steel Blade. Uh, it has the Shadow Portal. So any number of friendly Mandrake operatives can perform the Shadow Passage action. Uh, each turning point, if they start that action within uh, two or circle of one of your shadow portal tokens, and finish the action within a circle of the other. See, open shadow portal, right? So we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, this does not prevent one operative from performing the shadow passage action as as normal. Uh, you can use this ability even if this operative has been incapacitated. So once this you put it down, that just stays there for the rest of the game, like these shadow portal yeah. tokens. Yeah, and effectively this lets you, this is the other way, this is the way to basically do the Shadow Passage action more than once per turn. Because mm-hmm. otherwise you could just do it once, but if mm-hmm. you have a, a portal, then you can do it again. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so the Shade Weaver has a 2 AP action open Shadow Portal. I'll remove the Shadow, the shadow Portal tokens, uh, if any, perform a free Shadow Passage action with this operative, you do so before and after it moves, place one of your shadow portal tokens within two of this operative. And then we have Weave Darkness for one AP. Uh, remove your Weave Darkness token, uh, then place your Weave Darkness token in a location that is visible to this operative 
or on a vantage point of a terrain feature that is visible to this operative, treat it as an intended target for the purposes of the, visibil of the visibility line. That token creates an area of smoke with a circle radius and unlimited upward height, but not below. An operative is obscured if every cover line drawn to it crosses an area with smoke. This operative cannot perform this action while within engagement range. And uh, as soon as the operative, when this operative, if this operative is incapacitated, remove its Weave of Darkness token. So you're basically getting like a, a free smoke grenade for yeah, one AP that it. just lasts until this model <laughs> dies. That's pretty cool. And also he can throw it just anywhere he can see. I mean, this guy's got yeah. like a cannon for an arm. He just, he sees the <laughs> spot. He just launches it across the board. Uh, that's really good. Normally you can only drop a smoke six inches away and it goes away at the end of the turn. So this yeah. is just amazing. If your opponent doesn't have a way to ignore obscurity, which to be fair, a lot of teams nowadays do, but if they don't, uh, that's kind of a problem, yeah. I'd say. Uh, uh, but yeah, otherwise he's just a normal guy, right? His yeah. And shooting then, and attack. Uh, yeah, the shooting. Yeah, he's got the same as uh, just your other uh, mm -hmm. normal ones. And then there's the Mandrake Warrior. We don't have to cover him. Cause... Oh, wait. There is something to talk about here. Oh, okay. Um, and this is, I'm glad they did this because half of your guys are going to be Mandrake Warriors. Uh, there is a special ability here called Shadow Warrior on the Mandrake Warrior card. Where basically, if he's within shadow, you add one of the crit damage of his glimmer steel blade. So, oh. the magic warriors, if they're within shadow, have better melee than like your basic other specialists, other than like the you know the chooser, the flush, and the leader. Um, it basically their, their glimmer steel blade becomes a power weapon, four six lethal five. Yeah, which is pretty good. Uh, Ten wind models do not like that. Um, hey, commandos. Who just had their just a scratch nerfed? Maybe yep. don't like six damage crits. No, they do not. Uh, all right, so let's. I mean, let's talk about the uh, the strat ploys now that we have the context here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with creeping horror for one CP uh, until the end of the turning point after each enemy operative's activation. Before the next operative is activated, you can perform a free dash action with one friendly mandrake operative that has a conceal order if it starts and ends that action within shadow. Each friendly operative can only be selected for this play once per turning point. So reading this on the paper, I feel like it's a little harder to gauge the value of it, whereas I have a feeling, this is just a hunch, I could be wrong, that using this ploy, it's going to feel really powerful when you're actually like on the board using it. Because mm -hmm. in theory... It's after your opponent goes, so you, you know it's about to be your turn, and you make a free dash, and you can dash like into charge range where you weren't before, and now it's your turn, and you can charge. Right. Um, or you can dash closer to an objective, or you know you can dash another guy that is maybe in danger next time your opponent goes, out of danger. Um, and also, it's just a bunch of free movement. Yeah. It's like a lot of free movement. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just another way to like disrupt, I feel in, in a way it can, it can enable plays, but it can also disrupt your opponent's mm -hmm. plays that they have on the board. So that's really good. And then, uh, next we have gloaming shroud, Ryan, you want to do that one? Uh, until the end of the turning point, each time a shooting attack is made against a friendly mandrake operative within shadow, uh, in the roll defense dice step of that shooting attack before rolling defense dice, you can retain one as a successful normal save without rolling it, in addition to cover, if any. So a little hey, bit more that's... free saves. We love that, especially on a team I... like this, where they have a, you know, normally a five up invuln, but you're going to be within shadow for this, so you're getting more four ups. Yeah, you know, I actually really like this because. Normally, it feels like every team has like a defense strat ploy, and I usually advise not you, taking it. Yeah, yeah. But this, because you have a four up invuln, if you're in cover and in shadow, you're making two auto saves with your four up invuln. Uh, that's really good. Mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I guess if you're playing against a shooting team, you might want to use this, especially because we'll get to it later. But this team has like really awesome tech for dealing with melee, but. Um, yeah, so I, I like that, actually, as a defensive ploy. It's better than your average one. 
Um, all right. So blade in the dark for one CP is the next strat ploy. Basically, if you're if you're starting and ending your charges in um, shadow, you can charge and conceal. That's basically what it means for the for the turn. Uh, charge and conceal is pretty good. Yep. Um, it's kind of not sure what else whole thing. <laughs> yeah, not sure what else needs to be said about this. Uh, I'm sure it'll be worth the CP if you can reliably jump between one piece of heavy cover to the next. Mm-hmm. Because I mean. I need to keep reminding myself, within shadow, it's just within one inch of a heavy terrain feature, and you're within shadow, or under a vantage point, or within one of your portal. Um, so that's really good. Uh, yeah. Next up, Ryan, uh, yeah. want to do an escapable nightmare? Uh, until the end of the turning point, each time a friendly Mandrake operative within shadow fights in combat or makes a shooting attack in the roll attack dice step of that combat or shooting attack, you can reroll one of your attack dice. That's great. Yeah. That's probably going to be the one that you use the most out of the strat ploys, I yeah. think. If you like, have... That just... Yeah. I would say yeah. if you have uh, more than one operative like in shadow and you know they're going to be making attacks or they're, they are likely to, then it is worth it to use this. Uh, otherwise, use it on one of the other three really good strategic ploys that you have and uh, kind of just save that one CP for like attack roll or something. Yeah, I found myself like when I play teams, if they have a ploy like this where it's like three rolls and attacking, mm-hmm. I don't use it turn one. And then after turn one, I try to use it turn two and three and maybe turn four if I need it. Um, it's just, I think the most valuable thing you can spend CP on typically is attack rerolls. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's best if you can get it out of a strat play instead of, you know, CP reroll. Yeah. Uh, next, we're going to go to the tactical ploys, which I think the tactical ploys are where it's at with this team. But uh, we'll start with Slither out of sight. Uh, use this tactical ploy at the end of any operative's activation. Select one friendly Mandrake operative that has an engage order and is within shadow. Change his order to conceal. So it's interesting that you can do this with any guy. The logical thought for me is you activate a guy, flip into a gauge, shoot somebody, and then pay a CP to go back to conceal. But theoretically, you can change somebody else to conceal. Um, like if I guess the idea is if you like charge a guy and kill him, and there's no threat to the guy you just activated anymore in that side of the board, and your opponent's about to activate, you can flip another guy to conceal across the other side of the board that's about to get put into trouble. Um, so there's like some flexibility here. Uh, yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Soul Feast. Use this ploy at the end of the resolve successful hit step of a combat evolving or sh- or shooting attack made by a friendly Mandrake operative against an enemy operative within six of it. Uh, that friendly operative regains a number of lost wounds equal to that enemy operative's APL multiplied by the number of attack dice that inflicted damage in that combat or shooting attack. Excess attack dice are ignored. Uh, for example, if the enemy operative is incapacitated before remaining attack dice are resolved. So, like, let me make sure I'm reading this right. Friendly operative regains a number of lost wounds equal to that enemy operative's APL multiplied by the number of attack dice that inflicted damage. Um, you, I mean, like, I feel like you can oftentimes count on just getting healed back to full health with this. Do I have yeah. my math right here? I think you're right. If you say you hit a guardsman twice, you're getting four wounds back if you kill them in yeah. KCP. Uh, that's really good. That's all the more reason to not use those soul harvest tokens to heal yourself because you have soul feast. Yeah. Um, I think heals are, generally speaking, a little bit niche, but I think that's okay because this is a tactical ploy and you use it when it comes up. So... I think the worst thing is a strat ploy that's niche because you have to use it in advance and then hope it comes up. Whereas a tactical ploy that's niche, you just use it when it comes up. You don't have to like budget later, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yes, I think it's you're probably not going to do it a ton, but it's still good. Uh, and next up, I want to... How about, Ryan, can you do nowhere to hide? Because I want to do shadows. Yeah, the, nowhere to hide. 
Oh my goodness. Uh, use this ploy when a friendly Mandrake operative performs an action in which it moves. So that's your moves, your dash, your charges. Until the end of the activation, that operative can move through parts of terrain features as if they were not there. <laughs> As Can if this team did Elf not, Astray? yeah. As long as, <laughs> as if this team did not have enough cool tricks, that is a amazing tactical ploy. Yeah, I can just all I can think about is just using that blast guy to just like vanish through a wall and like blast the other team. Yeah, um, pretty good. Uh, I like that you, at a whim you can just do that when you need to. Um, and it's any action in which it moves. So that can be a charge. It could be whatever. Pretty good. You could use a fallback and just get a way out of dodge. Uh, really good. Anyway, I want to talk about Shadow's Bite, which is the last tactical ploy, and I think the best ploy this team has, because this is just amazing. Um, use this after an enemy operative performs the charge action, then the fight action, and selects a friendly Mandrake operative within Shadow as the target for that combat. In the resolve successful hit step of that combat, you are the attacker, i.e., you resolve the first hit. If both operatives have a rule with this effect, it has no effect for both operatives. So, uh, holy crap. Um, this is super good. So, like, basically, I mean, you kind of want to use this the first time you get fought every yeah. turn. Yep. I think this is what I would see myself spending the most CP on if I'm playing against a team that wants to charge me. Um so that's why I say, like, the, the part collector guy, the chooser of the flesh, um, he, like, it's not like you can, if you want to get him off the board before he gets in and, like, gets the harvest tokens, you can't really charge him and fight him. Because they'll just pay one CP and they're going to fight first. Um, so you have to shoot him off the board, which can be dicey because he has a four-up invuln, probably. Yeah. Um, so the Shadow's Bite is amazing. It's such good anti melee tech. I, I don't even know like how to describe it. Um, so really big fan of that. Um, uh, it just, I think it complicates things so much for this team because, like, if you're a team with melee operatives and you win initiative against Mandrakes, okay, well, the one guy's going to focus on one of your guys, so you can't activate him. Uh, one of your guys might be within six of the leader, so maybe you don't get to activate him. Um, another guy, you finally get to activate, and it's say it's a melee guy, and you charge and try to fight, and then they just pay CP and they fight you first. Yeah. Um, this team just has endless nonsense. It just yeah, they do. mess with you, and like yeah, this is really really good. I love the toolkit here. Yeah, it's a super cool toolkit. Um. Every every single model in this team, except for the Mandrake Warriors, uh, they read like Yu-Gi-Oh cards. There's so much going <laughs> on here. Um, yeah, this team's gonna take it's gonna take a lot of reps to uh, to like really get the play patterns down and just you know memorize all these rules for the teams. Um, so super cool that uh, uh, inside the box uh, it comes with quick reference cards for both this team as well as the uh, Night Lord's kill team. So, yeah, that will be super helpful. <laughs> also, just in general, the fact that the there's few specialists, but they're very involved. Yeah. They're very intricate. There's mm -hmm. a lot going on. So I, um, I'm i a big fan of this of this team, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go over the equipment really quick, and then we'll hit the tack ops, and we'll, we'll wrap up. So uh, first we have the one equipment point chain snare. Um, Chain snares suck. They exist in other teams. They've never been good in my eyes. Maybe it's better here because you have some shenanigans where like you can charge a guy and they never want to fight you because you'll fight first for a CP. So their only option is to fall back. And then if you have a chain snare, maybe they just can't fall back. I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's good. Yeah. Maybe this is the one world where a chain snare is good. Um, Next, we have Haunting Projection for two equipment points. It gives you a one AP action where you select an objective marker within six of the operative, and then until the end of the battle, when determining control of that objective, if the operative is alive that did it, you treat their APL as one less. This is okay. It's kind of cool that it lasts the whole battle, but... Uh, I mean... I mean, I, I like it just because this team natively is two APL. 
So like getting those uh, getting those models in elites down to counting as two APL for control of an objective, I think that can be pretty interesting because then you just need two bodies instead of, uh, well, I mean, you needed two bodies to begin with. But mm -hmm. anyways, you, you get you understand my point. Yeah, no, I mean, it's also kind of interesting because one of their bodies can't beat one of your bodies effectively. Yes, yep. Um, and this seems like you'd only ever take it on capture. I mean, I guess you can take it on secure and loot because to stop them from doing the action easier. But uh, the team doesn't have a lot of APL without, you know, those Soul Harvest tokens. So I don't know how easy it's going to be to actually just do this, but yeah. kind of interesting. Um, next, we have Shadow Glyph for three equipment points. Basically, this is Super Conceal. You just give a guy the Shadow Glyph and they have Super Conceal. Um, Love that. I think that's, yeah, for three, it's kind of steep, but... It's probably pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. um, on some boards, you just don't have enough cover. And you want Super Conceal. So um, definitely uh, on certain boards, a good take. Uh, next is my favorite piece of equipment here. It's the Spectral Essence for two equipment points. Uh, you add one inch to dashes for that operative. Um, for a team that can like dash a lot, especially if you're using like the dash after an enemy activates ploy. Yeah. You get a lot. It also this you pick this in the equipment stage, which means it would work for recon dash. You get a four inch oh, yeah. recon dash, I think. Um, unless I'm missing something, I believe that would you get I a four think, inch flying I think recon, recon dash. Yeah, recon is worded as perform a dash action, I believe. Yeah, so that's awesome. Uh, I think that's like the most generically useful thing here. Uh, next up is the soul gem, which is very good. Still, you give your uh, bell blast. It's two equipment points to give your Bell Blast Blast one inch. Um, so possibly an Into the Dark. Maybe you just, just spam, spam that? It? Yeah. I mean, 100%. What the that's heck, my first right? thought, yeah. <laughs> everybody, just give all your... everybody has a lethal five up ranged attack. That's pretty insane. Yeah, this team has a lot of good equipment, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, fortunately, is not good. It's Bone Darts. For one equipment point, it's uh, basically a pistol, limited silent, four shots on threes, two, three. It's a it's a six inch range, limited silent, las pistol. So yeah, um, yeah that that is horrible. <laughs> not good, uh, especially because this. I mean, even this is the one team where I actually think chain snares could be good. So don't take the las pistol if you have one AP left over. Um, and if you are going to take the chain snare, I guess take it on the chooser of the flesh, right? Yes, one hundred and ten percent. I mean, goodness, that's the guy to give it to. I see myself probably going soul gems on into the dark um and i don't know at least one or two guys that i want to grab objectives are probably going to grab spectral essence just to have the uh four inch dash so my first thought is like if you really want to try and get a kill turn one with the chooser of the flesh you can give him the spectral essence for a four inch dash and recon dash him up into shadow you know mm -hmm. and then pay a cp for creeping horror so you can dash after an enemy goes and then pay another cp for charge from conceal and then wait until the exact moment because you you charge for or you dash four inches up in recon mm -hmm. and then if your opponent moves within uh 13 inches of you after that move, you do a four inch dash into yep. uh, uh, shadow again, and then you activate that guy, and then you charge from conceal eight inches, and you basically can charge and hit a guy 16 inches from your deployment zone and uh, to just get a kill, get the ball rolling as fast as possible on those uh, on those slow weaver tokens. Yeah. Um, or whatever they're called. I think I've called them something different every time. It's soul <laughs> harvest tokens. Soul. Yeah, soul harvest. So that's my cheese. That's the only cheese I have to offer this early on in yeah. rating this team. Yeah, we haven't gotten a funny. chance to bring either of these teams to the table yet, but yeah, we've been thinking about these teams for a while now. So Yeah, so before we wrap up, Ryan, uh hot take rating. Well, we gotta talk uh, about these tack ops here, man. Oh god, you're right. We have tack yeah. ops. <laughs> There's three of them. Um I also want to mention we should we should talk about the archetype for this team because I don't think we've mentioned it yet. They can take infiltration, recon, and seek and destroy uh for their tac ops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I did mention that, but you're right. We didn't like elaborate on it at all. 
Um, do you want to start with the first tech op, Ryan? Sure. So, uh, faction tech op one, Death from Darkness. If a friendly Mandrake operative is activated within shadow, performs the charge action, incapacitates an enemy operative in combat, and ends that activation within shadow, you score one VP. And if you do it again, on another turn, you score another VP. Uh, and this gets revealed in the target reveal step of any turning point. Uh, Shane, do you think that this is an auto-take? I don't know. I mean, it depends on the board, right? Because if yes, there's a lot 100%. of heavy cover... Yeah. If there, yeah, if there's a lot of heavy cover, then yes, this is quite easy to do. Um, some boards are a little bit sparser, but I think in general, what we'll learn is that playing this team, you'll probably just notice casually that I think the the in shadow like that those criteria that's typically where models hang out anyway yeah. they like to be in heavy cover they like to hide under vantage points you know like against a door so my gut tells me that this is actually probably very easy but you know i guess it depends it might be harder if there's objectives out in the open or something yeah uh next up we have shadows reach faction tech op 2 uh, reveal it in the target reveal step of any turning point. Um, at the end of any turning point, if a friendly Mandrake operative controls a terrain feature wholly within your opponent's territory, it has any parts of the heavy trait, you score a victory point. And then if you do it again in a different turn with a different piece of terrain, you score another victory point. Um, th I don't like this. So this, I feel like this will almost always be bad. Because a lot of the time, your opponent is not going to have two pieces of heavy terrain wholly within their territory. Yeah. They'll definitely have one, and you'll have one. And then a lot of the time, all the other heavy terrain is like kind of on the center line in both players' territory a little bit. Um, so there's going to be, I think most boards, you just can't score this. Um, yeah, and like, I don't know. It's just really projected and like... I don't know. I don't really like it very much. Yeah, so the last one we have here, Faction Tech Op 3, Haunting Manifestation. Uh, at the end of any turning point, excluding the fourth, if a friendly Mandrake operative is visible to and within three of the... Oh, okay, hang on. I completely skipped something. Reveal this Tech Op in the target reveal step of any turning point. When you do so, select one enemy operative. At the end of any turning point, excluding the fourth, if a friendly Mandrake operative is visible to and within three of that enemy operative, excuse me, you score one. And if you achieve the first condition, and at the end of the battle, that enemy operative has not been incapacitated, you score one VP. Uh, I I don't like this automatically. It's kill team. I'm trying to kill as many things <laughs> as possible. Uh, attack op that uh, forces me to leave a model alive but also be extremely close to it. Yeah. Uh, not well, not a fan of this one. I don't think you ever take this one. Maybe like against a horde, you like do it to their comm specialist who can't hurt you very well. But I mean, I don't know. I'd rather just take death from darkness and just, you know, just kill them, just yeah. charge them. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, I think death from darkness is the best of these three. I suppose with the wrong board, it could be bad, but mm -hmm. Fortunately, they have Recon and Seek and Destroy. Yeah, both very good, um, you know, archetypes to have. So I think they're pretty well-rounded when it comes to uh, their tack op selection. Yeah. Uh, all right. Now, Ryan, do you have a final grade for the Mandrake kill team? Uh, if I were to throw them into a tier list, I would say probably high A. Um, oh, yeah, high A? Yeah, I would say high A. I mean, like, this early on... Uh, in the team's life cycle, I mean, I could, I could see them winning a tournament tomorrow. You know, I could put, I'll, I'll put them in S tier. Um, but that, S tier. But I'll put Ooh. them in S tier, but that's only because, oh. you know, because nobody's played against this team yet. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. So that, but if, assuming, you know, we'll say a month from now, nothing about the game has changed or whatever. I, I'm, I'm solid in putting them in A tier. I'd be okay with the A tier too. Mm. I do think that um, for all the amazing tricks this team has, their models are very fragile, um, and it you know I think that yeah five of the gold with nine wounds. 
Yeah, so if they're not on the open, yeah, so if they're in the open, if they're not within shadow, they're going to die like nothing. Like they're just going to die to a bolter. Yep. Um, But they have an amazing toolkit. I don't think they're going to be easy to play. That's my hunch. Um, And yeah, I mean, I, I, especially, so I mean, today, as of recording this, the Void Dancers got nerfed. So I would say that this looks to be the best elf team on release pretty yeah. much yeah i think uh, you're and right. i think a i think a is a good bet as far as hot take goes mm-hmm. so um thank you guys all for tuning in and watching our uh our little kind of like first reaction first take hot take of the new mandrake kill team thank you to games workshop for sending this box ahead to shane and i ahead of time for us to do a review on um, if you guys enjoy the content that we're producing, make sure to subscribe down below. That way you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos. Definitely go and check out the other half of this two-part series where we talk about the uh, the Void the void Claw? Not Void Claw. Nemesis Claw. Nemesis <laughs> Claw. The Nemesis Claw kill team. The new Night Lord kill team. Go and check that out. And if you want to support Shane and I, uh, go ahead and check out our Patreon where Shane actually has been uploading a bunch of uh, Kill Team content that uh, you can see at the higher tier levels on our Patreon. So yeah, go check that out. Uh, Thank you guys all for watching, and we'll see you all again soon.